Here in Arizona, we're used to hot, dry conditions. Other than in the monsoon season of July and August, most of the year, much of Arizona experiences drought conditions. We still are now, even though the monsoon has officially started, it seems pretty dry right now. But the church is also going through a spiritual drought. In scripture, rain represents the falling of the Holy Spirit. And there has been too little of the Holy Spirit for too long a time. The church has been going through a season of drought. When will the Holy Spirit latter rain ever come? It came once before. There's a scientific principle that says that identical circumstances will always produce identical results. So if we could find the circumstances that brought the spiritual rain before, then if we could simply duplicate the circumstances, we could be guaranteed that the rain would come again. And what were those circumstances that brought the early rain? Acts, the first chapter, in the 14th verse, speaking of the disciples in the upper room after the ascension of Jesus. Acts 1, verse 14. These all continued with one accord in prayer and supplication with the women and Mary, the mother of Jesus, and with his brethren. Acts 2 and verse 1. And when the day of Pentecost was fully come, they were all with one accord in one place. And then again in the second chapter and the 46th verse, Acts 2 verse 46, and they continuing daily with one accord in the temple and breaking bread from house to house did eat their meat with gladness and singleness of heart. One accord. Some translations say they were of one mind. The Amplified Bible says that they were one in purpose. Brethren and sisters, when there was unity in that early church, there was Holy Spirit power. And when we duplicate the circumstances, God will duplicate the power. Our lesson this morning, where there is Christian unity, there is Holy Spirit power. Where there is unity, there is power. Now there need to be three kinds of unity, I believe, before we can have the latter rain. Three kinds of unity before the drought will end. First of all, there needs to be unity and love between the brethren. Would you turn now to the book of Luke? The Gospel of Luke, the ninth chapter. Luke chapter 9, it's the story of the transfiguration. Jesus on the mountain with Peter, James, and John. And as Jesus comes down from the mountain, he is met by a father whose only son is ill, devil-possessed. He says in verse 40, I brought him to your disciples, but they could not help. Now verses 41 to 43, and Jesus answering said, O oh, faithless and perverse generation, how long shall I be with you and suffer you? Bring thy son hither. And as he was yet a coming, the devil threw him down and tear him. And Jesus rebuked the unclean spirit and healed the child and delivered him again to his father. And they were all amazed at the mighty power of God. Jesus healed the young man. And the verse immediately after that story is Luke chapter 9 and verse 46. Then there arose a reasoning among them, which of them should be greatest. So long as there was disunity, so long as they were vying with one another for a sense of importance, the disciples were powerless. But mind you, these same men, only a few months later, what tremendous power God gave them when they were united. Disunity, powerless. United, power. They had power, Acts the fifth chapter says, to heal the sick and to raise the dead. 
Acts, the second chapter, says that 3,000 converts were won in a single day. History suggests that in the first 100 years of the existence of that early Christian church, somewhere between 5 and 10 million people were converted to Christianity. This the result of unity between the brethren in the church. Turn, if you will, please, to the book of John, the Gospel of John. 17th chapter is where our responsive reading was found. John, the 17th chapter. Jesus was closing his earthly ministry. And he prays now his parting prayer for his disciples, for his church. And notice that Jesus did not pray that the church would be large. Sometimes we think that there is success in the church only if there are more people in the church. Jesus never prayed that the church be large. Jesus never prayed that the church should be rich. Sometimes we think if we just had a little more money, Jesus never prayed for a wealthy church. Rather, he prayed for oneness in the church. Let's read it here in John chapter 17, verses 21 to 23. That they may that they all may be one as thou, Father, art in me and I in thee, that they also may be one in us, that the world may believe that thou hast sent me. And the glory which thou gavest me, I have given them, that they may be one even as we are one. I in them and thou in me, that they may be made perfect in one, and that the world may know that thou hast sent me and hast loved them as thou hast loved me. Did you count the number of times Jesus used the word one? One, one, that they may be one. The great concern of Jesus as he left his church was a concern for unity. Brothers and sisters, the devil doesn't care how much talent there is in the church. The devil doesn't care how many influential people there are in the church. So long as he can keep those people from pulling together, he knows that nothing is going to happen. You ever been to the fair and seen those great giant workhorses? Those big Belgians or Clydesdales, feet the size of a big dinner plate? I got to see them up close once. They had the Budweiser team uh, in Sierra Vista a number of years ago for a parade or some, some event. And they allowed people to come and see the horses up close. I mean, you just stand next to them and they just tower above you, just massive, very strong animals. Powerful. Now take two of those great muscular horses, harness them, hitch them to a load, let's say a load of 100 pounds. Can they pull the load? Here we have two big, powerful workhorses hitched to a 100 pound load. Can they pull the load? Not if they're pulling in opposite directions, they can't. And there's a great deal of dust stirred up in the air and a whole lot of perspiration. And the only thing that will happen is that somebody winds up patching harness. Take two strong, creative, thinking people with overwhelming talent and put them together in a church. Put them to the load. Can they pull it? Not if they're pulling in opposite directions. The tragedy is that too many pastors today are spending most of their time patching harness. And if the talent in the church is pulling in opposite directions and the load doesn't get pulled, and if the pastors are spending their time patching harness as a result, how is the church going to move? Love attracts. I'm sure all of us have been around those outdoor floodlights at night. We don't quite have the same problem here with bugs as we used to when we lived in Texas years ago. But at certain times of the year in Texas, you couldn't get within 20 feet of those big lights in any direction without getting overwhelmed with those tiny gnat-like insects. You know, up your pant legs and your ears and your eyes, up your nostrils, attracted by the light. In such a way, men and women are attracted by love. 
And if you will set in a given community a light that we sometimes call a church, and if you will have love within that church, you will attract people just like gnats are attracted to the light. Jesus said, and I, if I be lifted up, will draw all to me. People love to be where they feel loved. Why is it that the tavern is full while the church is empty? Because folks, sometimes the tavern is the friendliest place in town. Meanwhile, over at the church, they're preaching against the evils of alcohol in an atmosphere that is so cold you could ice skate down the center aisle. We don't like to admit this, especially about ourselves, of course, but it's a long and well-established fact that people choose churches mostly on the basis of fellowship. Now, you may feel that you're here this morning because of a belief, but if you felt no fellowship here, you likely wouldn't be here for long. I suspect that each one here could think of an incident that has kept a new visitor from returning to a church, this one or another one. I know I could name several over the years, but I've known other families who have gone to this church or another Adventist church just once, and they said, we want to be a part, we want to be members, because we feel such a friendship here. I know a lot of families and individuals who change their membership to a different Adventist church based on the need for friendship. And unfortunately, I also know several Adventists who have even joined another denomination, and typically they say they can't accept all the doctrines that they're teaching over there, but they're so friendly. Do you suppose anybody isn't here this morning because they don't think we're friendly? Let me tell you something, almost to a man, almost to a woman, those who are visited that are known as backsliders would tell us that that's exactly why they're not here. Because as true as it is that people choose a church mostly on the basis of fellowship, it is even more true that people attend church mostly on the basis of fellowship. And you show me someone in this community who may be a member or a former member of this congregation or of this denomination who no longer attends, and I will show you someone who does not feel wanted. People who do not feel a fellowship stop coming. Oh, how we need unity and love and acceptance in the church. Please don't appease your conscience by saying that these people are just careless or just irreligious people. They are not here because they are not convinced that we want them here. The book Testimonies to Ministers, page 188. When there is love manifested by brother to brother, there will be proportionate force and power in our work for the salvation of men. When there is love manifested, brother to brother, sister to sister, how much love do you and I manifest? Not how much love, do do you believe in love? Do you teach about love in your church? No, it's love manifested, love that you show to someone by your words and by your actions. Love manifested brings a proportionate force and power in our work for the salvation of men. But on the other hand, disunity stunts spiritual growth. I got the grandkids out a couple of weeks ago and we planted some corn, an ornamental corn. I don't do much of the gardening stuff from uh, stuff that I eat. I let other people grow them and I don't have to deal with the pests and the diseases and the problems, you know, and then I go and go to the farmer's market or something and pick it up there. Well, we planted some ornamental corn and, you know, it said on the package like seven to 21 days germination time and three days they were already coming up. We're really anxious to get going and now they're only like two weeks old and they're already like this tall. Pretty little plants. I had to get something that grows fast, you know, because the grandkids are kind of impatient. They're like, you know, they want to be able to go out the next week and pick some corn. 
friend of mine from work planted some corn a few summers ago, and the stalks looked pretty good. He'd come to work all pleased with the progress. First time he'd grown, you know, had a vegetable garden, and his corn was coming up so good, and he'd come and talk and kind of keep me apprised of the progress. He planted his crop to coincide with the monsoon season, which is what we did as well, if it ever gets here. So he wouldn't have to water it so much, and there's nothing like a good rain to make the crops grow. But that year it didn't rain very much. And he didn't water enough. And when it came time to have sweet corn, he brought in a sample of his harvest. The ears hardly put out any kernels at all. There were just a few little nubbins, because when there's drought, there's no growth. And as you look carefully into your own heart this morning, if you have not been growing as you would like, if you're not finding yourself day by day, week by week, year by year, closer and closer to Christ, may I suggest that there is probably some bitterness, some hurting, some resentment way down deep within your mind and heart that creates a wedge between you and a brother or a sister. Take it to the Lord in prayer. You cannot grow until that obstruction is removed because where there is unity, there is growth and there is power. Secondly, not only must there be unity between the brethren and the church, there must be unity also between the people and their leaders. We won't take the time to turn to it, but Exodus, the 17th chapter, if you want to look at that chapter later on this afternoon, gives us a beautiful story of two ways to look at the leadership. It's Exodus 17. It starts with the Israelites camped at Rephidim, and there wasn't any water. Now, we living in the desert, we understand what that's like. You know, the water gets turned off for a repair or something. It's off for a couple hours, and we're like, when's it going to come? When's it going to come out again? Here were these perhaps a couple million people in the middle of the desert with no water, with their flocks and their herds, cause for real alarm. And so they were all complaining. Moses thought for a while that they were going to stone him. All you wanted to do was to get us out here and kill us all off and gather up the leftovers and go back to the palace of rich man. Complaints, criticism against the leadership. They did it repeatedly. The latter part of that very same chapter, Exodus 17, talks about the other attitude toward leadership. The Amalekites came, and Moses sent Joshua out to fight. And Moses stood up on the hill holding aloft the rod of God, but his hands got tired, and gradually they began to fall. And everybody noticed that when the rod came down, the Amalekites won, and when the rod was up, Israel was winning. And so Aaron and Hur got hold of a rock, and they rolled it over beneath Moses, and they set him down, and they got one on one side and one on the other, and they held up his hands until the going down of the sun, and God's people won a great victory. Now you are in one of those two stories. What is your attitude toward the leadership? Are you one of those who always finds fault with decisions the board makes or something that's going on in the church, the way the money's spent, whatever it is, do you find a way always to criticize and complain? Or do you hold up the hands of those that have been called into leadership? We don't know much about the man, her, from Scripture, yet when God took a look at what he saw that day, he said, put that man in the book, because here is a gift worth preserving. And I don't know what you feel your gift to be, but is there anybody here that could not hold up the hands of the leadership? Which story is the story of your life? You know, you don't have to be perfect to work for God. None of us that are in leadership position are perfect. How would you like to have had David, the murderer, the adulterer, as the general conference president? He was, you know. How would you like to have had Moses, also a murderer, to teach our kids at our beautiful Cochise SDA school. That great lawgiver, that fellow who was so quick with the rod. Would you like him teaching your kids? Yet God was able to use them. God has never been able to find perfect people, not even for leadership, but God uses what he finds and he blesses their ministry. 
If we could just learn the lesson of the old cow, you know, she comes to the manger and a little cheap, poor hay has just been thrown in. And what's the cow do? Just stick her nose in the air and say, not for me, not good enough for me. Not if she's hungry, she doesn't. She gets that slimy nose busy going round and round and down she goes past the thistle, past the clod of dirt, and past the moldy hay until down there away someplace in the pile she finds something that's good and she comes up chewing it contentedly. Don't you think that's a Christian way to look at leadership, to overlook the bad and to accept the good? Brethren and sisters, it was criticism of the leadership that split the heavenly church. It was criticism of even the absolutely perfect leadership that brought sin into our universe. And it is criticism of the leadership that keeps disunity in our church today. But how can we improve the church if we don't criticize when there's a problem? After all, we just stated that we have an imperfect leadership. The church, scripture says, is a woman. And husbands, I hope you learned long before now that just about the only way to change a woman is to love her. You can criticize her. You can tell her what she's doing that you don't like from now until your 50th anniversary, except you probably wouldn't make it that long. She's not going to change much, but bless her heart, she'll do just about anything for love, anything to keep that union. Of course the church needs to grow. Of course the church needs to improve. But the only person that can clean up the church is a person who really loves the church. The Bible also compares the church to a body. The parts of the body are very different, very separate, and yet they have one purpose. And when it comes about noon, like what it is right now, time that just right, When it comes around noon, I get an empty feeling in my stomach. And then I look at the clock. It's about dinner time. Soon I will hear the busyness coming from the kitchen. And then I follow my nostrils into the dining room. Now those four senses surely perceive the meal altogether differently, each from the other, and yet individually different as they are, they all have one purpose, and that's to get me to the table. Hallelujah. Praise the Lord. And that's when the sense of taste comes in. We in the church, we don't have to think alike. We don't have to be alike. God forbid that only a certain type of personality should fit into the church, but we, like the, whole, like the early Christian church, must be one in purpose. The single purpose of every member of this church must be to help the world learn to love Jesus. Thirdly, there must be unity and love not only between the brethren. There must be unity and love not only between the people and their leaders. There must also be unity with Christ. John, the 15th chapter. <clears throat> fourth and fifth verses. John 15, 4 and 5. Abide in me and I in you. As a branch cannot bear fruit of itself except it abide in the vine, no more can ye except ye abide in me. I am the vine, ye are the branches. He that abideth in me and I in him, the same bringeth forth much fruit, for without me ye can do nothing. Now many years ago when I first started planting trees in my yard, I got a bunch of fruit trees, small little saplings, planted them out in the yard, and each of them came with a plastic tag, you know, that wraps around, you kind of cinch it up. So I left a little room for growth when I did it. I was planning ahead. Then I forgot all about those little tags. And a number of years later, the tags were all kind of covered up with undergrowth or with dried leaves or whatever it was. And I couldn't see the tags anymore. And I started seeing some of the trees start to decline. And I wondered, what's going on? And when I got down and started looking at it close, I could see that those tags were still right where I had put them. And the trunk had grown. And it was constricting the growth there. 
and I had some damage to trees and even lost a couple of them before I realized what I had done. Is there any obstruction today between yourself and Christ? Is there any attitude of criticism, of disunity, of rebellion, of resentment toward anyone that is coming between yourself and your Savior? It could be somebody in your church. It could be somebody right in your own home. It's an emergency. It may not destroy your religious experience immediately, but it is ultimately still a matter of life and death. And so every day work on your connection with the source of life. I was out pruning some vines and I tried to grow a lot of things together in my yard just to save room and I had a couple of different kinds of vines growing up one support. And one vine I really wanted to have prosper and the other vine was getting a little rambunctious and so I was going to cut that one back severely. And the stems look quite a bit alike. And I was looking with my pruning shears kind of up close and, okay, this is where I need to make my cut. And I cut it way down close to the ground. And about an hour later, I went back out there. And the vine that I wanted to save was completely wilted in the heat. I had severed the wrong vine. Jesus said, chapter 15 of John Verse 6, if a man abide not in me, he is cast forth as a branch and is withered. And men gather them and cast them into the fire, and they are burned. If ye abide in me, and my words abide in you, you shall ask what ye will, and it shall be done unto you. Herein is my Father glorified, that ye bear much fruit, so shall ye be my disciples. As the Father hath loved me, so have I loved you. Continue ye in my love. If you keep my commandments, you shall abide in my love, even as I have kept my Father's commandments and abide in his love. These things have I spoken unto you, that my joy might remain in you, and that your joy might be full. So the church has for too long a time been going through its spiritual drought. We need the latter rain. And it cannot come until there is unity. Where does this leave you today? I invite you to join hands with one another, to join hands with our leaders, and above all, to join hands with Christ. Then the drought will end, and the rain will fall. Some years ago on the prairies of Canada, Mother opened the door of the house to call her little five-year-old daughter in to supper. She called and she called and there was no response. She became frightened and she ran out to the barn, but the little girl wasn't there either. So a search party was formed. Back and forth they combed over those immense prairies to no avail. All night long, they searched for the little girl. All the next day, the next night, the next day. Until finally on the third day, the constable called the search party together and he said to the father, I am so sorry, but these men have gone virtually without sleep. We have looked everywhere. She's simply not to be found. We're going to have to give up the search. The idea was unthinkable in the mind of that father. Oh, please. Please, she's got to be someplace. But we've looked every place. Listen, said the father. There's one thing we have not done. Couldn't we form just one long, long line and be so close together that we could join hands? And couldn't we just comb down through the fields together hand in hand and search for just one more time? Well, they couldn't say no. And so they formed an immensely long line, hand in hand, and sure enough, they'd gone a surprisingly short distance. When one of the men looked down, and there, almost buried beneath a giant tuft of prairie grass, he saw a leg, and the little girl was found. But the cold nights and the exposure had been too much. She was dead. 
And they placed her in the outstretched hands of her father and that poor man turning his eyes toward heaven, the tears streaming down. He cried over and over, Oh God, why didn't we join hands sooner? Today, may I ask you that same question? Oh God, why haven't we joined hands sooner? Let's pray. Dear loving Father in heaven, we're just so thankful for the unity in the Godhead that loves us so much. And you ask that we have that same kind of unity here in your high priestly prayer in John 17. Lord, we're all very different people. We have different desires, different backgrounds, different goals, different stories. We're all your children. We're all part of the family of God. Lord, I just ask that just now your Holy Spirit will come into each heart and each mind. Unite us in our homes, in our families. Unite us in this church. May we become one. And may the desire of each person here today, each person in our church, be to help the world learn to love Jesus is my prayer in Jesus' name. Amen.